Ryan, welcome to the show, brother. How are you? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I'm excited. We're going to do uh, one we've never done before, bands from other bands. And when you get digging through this topic, you realize how many of these guys all come from different things. They break up from the ashes of another band as a new band. There's just tons of them. There are tons of them. And going through them, you could really stretch it, too. You know what I mean? Like, my honorables have shit on there that I'm like, ooh, this is a stretch, but technically it works. So, yes. But, you know, the, the 10 we have, or the 10 I have, I'm sure we'll have a, maybe we'll have some similarities, but, yeah, they're really cool bands. Yeah, a lot of them are just some of my favorite ones. And, like, I do have, I have a lot of honorables, too. Some of them are, like, real big bands that are known for, you know, people coming from even even bigger bands. You know what I mean? Just descendants of oh, bigger yeah. acts, but they're not always my favorite bands. And another exciting thing that we got going on, we just released our second track with our Metalcast project, Headbangers Ball, dedicated to the show of the same name, man. What do you think? I think it's another cool song. I mean, it's a sing-along song. It's stuck in your head. Um, you made a, a great, great uh, musical background to this. It was a great platform and foundation for us to write lyrics to, and I think it's really cool. Yeah, I'm excited to play it. So we'll do just like we did with Heavy Metal Rambo. We'll probably midway through this podcast, we'll premiere it on here and let us know what you think in the comments. But now, let's just jump in, man. I want to hear what your number 10 is of bands formed from other bands. All right, well, thanks. So number 10, I'm kicking it off with one of my giants here. It's Widowmaker from 1992 Ooh. doing Blood and Bullets. Good one. Good one. <laughs> yeah. So of all the bands on this list, this was the one where I'm actually the most stoked that the prior band dissolved. <laughs> <laughs> um, Not a twisted sister I, I, guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It, it's it's very odd, you know. Like, D didn't change much. But I've said it before. I I think Love is for Suckers is such a good album. And I don't really love the prior Twisted Sister albums. And and I don't know that I just didn't give them a fair shake up until this point, or Love is for Suckers is more of that pop metal later in the yeah. 80s. So um, this band was cooking, though, man. You had Al, Pet Al Petrelli, uh, who played with Alice Cooper, Cooper. Joe Lynn Turner, Sabotage, just to name a few. Yep. Um, just, just a killer, huge album, huge choruses. And Dee Snyder... I think sounds the best he's ever sounded on this album. So that's why I put it just to kick off this massive list at uh, number 10. You know, it's weird. I've never, it's not that I dislike Widowmaker. I don't know if I've ever given him like a, a, a fair shake. You know what I mean? Like I really need to go back and listen to him. I was always a Twisted Sister guy. Not like huge Twisted Sister, but I mean, I bought Stay Hungry that like early on in my metal uh, journey. You know what I mean? So I, I got some love for Twisted Sister. I got to go back and give uh, give a listen to Widowmaker. Yeah, dude. I'll tell you real quick. When I fell in love with with, uh, with Widowmaker was I was sitting in the parking lot uh, about ready to go see a package poison show in the early 2000s. It was, it was maybe even like 2000 or 2001. And in the car was the orgy guitarist Ty Oliver, our buddy Ty Oliver. Ty, yes. we, we, we used to go to concerts together. Um and he played me this album, and I went, oh, my God, like, this is D. Snyder. This is, who is this Widowmaker? And he's like, dude, you got to check this out. And chorus after chorus was a standout, huge. And I went, oh, man, this, I, I, you opened my eyes, bro. So credit to Ty Oliver again. <laughs> nice. We'll give Ty the shout out. All right. My number 10. I gotta go with Cold Sweat. Ooh, nice. Mark Ferrari leaves Keel. Uh, when I had him on the podcast, he was saying Keel was going into a direction where they wanted to add a keyboardist, and Mark just wasn't agreeing where things were going. Uh, wasn't any bad blood or anything. He just said, "You know what? I'm out of here. I'm going to form my own band." Wanted to call the band Ferrari, but I think he got in some trouble with uh, the car maker Ferrari, so he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't use that name, and he he came up with the name Cold Sweat. And then he, uh, he actually had Oni Logan in the band, and then George Lynch stole him. That's 
I mean, that might be coming up for somebody. That's another band from another band. But <laughs> but uh, Only Logan was stolen from Cold Sweat. And then they got Roy Cathy. But that's such a great album, man. I know we talk about it a lot. I hope people, if you missed it, you know, it was 1990. Times were kind of changing. It was just about to all switch. So they weren't like a huge band. But really kick-ass stuff, man. Four on the Floor, Waiting in Vain, Let's Make Love Tonight. Just a great hair model album is, is the only other way to put it. You know, it's just straight up good hair model. So Mark Ferrari leaves Keel, forms Cold Swat. So cool that you put such a giant at number 10, as did I, which just goes to show how solid this list is going to be. And I have Cold Sweat on my list. It's much higher because I love that band. Um, I always remember the story about George Lynch approaching Honey Logan and says, do you want to be in a band called Ferrari or do you want to drive one? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not sure if that ever came to fruition, but it's a pretty cool little uh, cocky statement that George Lynch had. <laughs> nice. All right, man. What do we got for number nine? <laughs> number nine is Roadhouse from 1991, and this is the pete willis of early death leopard fan band yeah i always so, thought pete willis never did anything outside of death leopard i thought like he was just went into hiding so good to know <laughs> yeah it took him eight years <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, to sober up <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you know he was booted out for boozing too much um halfway through the recording of pyromania but my theory, dating back to our hair metal conspiracies episode, was that he wasn't pretty enough. <laughs> uh, yes. And uh, for what was coming, yeah, show. for the hair, a whole hair metal scene, he wasn't he wasn't cute enough. <laughs> I know exactly. So uh, you know, they had their eye on Phil, who was a little bit cuter at the time. But that's just my theory. There's, there's, there's nothing factual here. But um, I I really hope he pulled a John Sykes here though and got just shit ton of money and didn't have to work again for the rest of his life and he made roadhouse and lived a good life i don't know what he's doing anymore um but it's a really cool kind of a little bit softer it's it's not a hard um anything like the hardest stuff off pyromania or anything it's a little bit softer keyboardy album but um check out all join hands tower of love and hell can wait that's a good little um Three three piece song out of a uh, roadhouse. So yeah, check that album out. I'm gonna check it. I had no idea that it, he ever did anything uh, outside of Death Leopard. I mean, I assumed he did something, but I didn't know he ever like put out an album or anything. So cool, good to yeah, know. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if it's streaming on like Spotify and whatnot, but it is out there. I bought the CD years ago. It's got like an old truck, kind of like a uh, uh, illustrated old truck on the cover. So it's a little bit hard to find, I think, but it, it's a good album. All right, number nine, man. I got to go with Shadow King. We got Lou Graham leaving Foreigner. We've got Vivian out of White Snake, and, and before that, he was out of Dio. So he's he's a guy from uh, from uh, different bands. He's been in a couple different bands, <laughs> but they created a great project. You know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it is kind of like that same thing. It was came out in 91. It's just like it was really over at this point for, for this kind of music. I think if this could have came out in 89, probably would have fared a lot better. One thing I didn't realize, which probably some people might know if you follow Lou Graham, is that Vivian Campbell played on Long Hard Look. So I think that's where the relationship between these guys kind of got started. But we talk about this album all the time, so I thought this would be a great time to just give it a plug again. If you don't know the Shadow King album, go back and check it out. Anytime, anywhere, This Heart of Stone, and then Danger in the Dance of Love. Oh, what a song. So just <laughs> once upon a time, I mean, I, I could. the whole thing is good. There's there's really no bad songs on it. And it's just like, uh, it's, you know, it's like it's that melodic rock with the updated production, killer stuff. <clears throat> it's on my list. Uh, of course, see, it I would knew, be. I, I figured though. I figured Cold Sweat and, and Shadow King would be on your list. <laughs> Absolutely. I did not know about the long hard look thing with Vivian though. That's really cool because I love that album. It's, yep. it's a little bit, you know, less. It's a little bit poppier, 
deeper than the stuff we generally discuss, but it's a really good album and Lou's voice is, is on on fire on that album. So that, that's is. really cool. You know, I bought that when I, there was a time, you know, not that long ago when I had a car that had a tape deck in it and I found mm-hmm. this like at a secondhand shop and I really did like Long Hard Look. It's, it's a really good album. And I mean, obviously the single Just Between You and Me is great and, and there's a lot of other great songs on there too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, man, number eight. Well, this one I bet will appear on yours, but it's Freely's Comet. <laughs> nice. So, uh, yeah, yeah, from the ashes of a, a little-known band named Kiss. I heard comes of those guys. This class. <laughs> <laughs> comes in this classic band, yeah. Uh, but they have two standout albums. I, I love Rock Soldiers, Into the Night, and I really love their second album. That's probably... I think I got their second album first, um, so I'm most familiar. I love Insane, Time Ain't Running Out, Dancing with Danger. has that really odd, like almost out of key chorus sung by Ace, but it yep. works, you know? Yeah. And and then my favorite song in the album, which is a ballad, which is very different, is It's Over Now. Yeah. And that ballad appeared on your ballads list we did and yep. I forgot about it dude and that was one that I absolutely would have included because it's such a cool um, moody ballad and it's um, who's the lead singer on that one Todd Howarth that's right yeah so he he kills it on this one but I also want to give a nod out to the Words Are Not Enough on the Life Plus One album. That's a great song. And I actually, I bought that years ago, and I never really paid attention to that song, and I really like it. So, Freddie's Comet really kicks ass. I love the band, and I love their their two, two and a half-ish <laughs> albums. Now, you're gonna this is going to be shocking, but for some reason, okay. I didn't put Freddie's Comet on my list. I love Freely's Comet. Really? Comment. Yeah, because I just wanted to focus on certain bands that we don't get to talk about as much. I feel like I talk about Freely's Comet until I'm blue in the face. So I didn't put Freely's Comet on. So there's my first point that I want to make. Second <laughs> point is this uh, Rock Soldiers came onto my playlist the other day. And it's a great song, man. It really is. And it, it's one of those yeah. things where, like, nobody else could pull this off but Ace Freely. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's one of those things where, like, if, if you read these lyrics and somebody else tried it, you'd say, oh, this is kind of corny. Like, this is cheesy. But something about Ace, because he's such a rock guy, like, he's he lived the rock life. So it's believable. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, all, it's a true story about something, getting into a car crash, being all drunk and running from the cops and stuff. The third point I wanted to make is I was going to look this up, but then I forgot to. But Todd Howarth is from another band. Isn't he from like a band called 809 or something? Uh, Gee, I, you know what? You, you stumped me there. I do not know. Okay. He, he's, he comes from another band as well. So everybody can chime in. I didn't look it up. I remember. I want to say it's called 809 or 909. Or, so it's a number. He comes from a band that's a number. So sue me. I don't know the, what the correct answer is. I'm not, I'm not a human Wikipedia. You know what I mean? I'm trying. But. <laughs> When I know because you, you <laughs> held out on the on, you held out on the kiss up from the ashes stuff because you're going to talk about Mark St. John's album White Tiger. <laughs> <right? laughs> no, <laughs> all right. Instead, I'm going to do my number eight, and this is a band. This is big. This is big time. They all came from other bands, and it's Blue Murder. I mean, I can't not mention Blue Murder. You know what I mean? We nice. got oh yeah, John Sykes coming off the success. Actually, he didn't even get to taste the success. He was booted before the <laughs> success even came off of the White State right. 1987 self-titled album. We got yeah. Tony Franklin coming out of the firm with Jimmy Page. Carmen Apice, I mean, damn, I mean, he was in King Cobra before this, but, I mean, he's been in a million bands. He played with Rod Stewart and Ozzy, and I, I think he played in Vanilla Fudge. And, I mean, it's just it's just endless where this guy comes from. And a couple things about, I mean, obviously, I all the songs are great on this album, but really the standouts are probably the singles, Daily of the King, Jelly Roll, Riot is a great song, Blue Murder. But the cool thing about this album is the production. And if you go back and you look who produced it, it's Bob Rock. And, you know, it's no, no shocker oh, there. Yeah. The drums are just so huge. Like, Carmine's drums are just so huge on this album. So Bob Rock did a killer job with the production. John Sykes is a great singer, right? That's the thing, you know, we knew him as a guitar guy with, with uh, Thin Lizzy and with White Snake, but he really is an amazing singer. And yeah. the whole band's tight. Tony Franklin's doing that uh, bass stuff with the fretless bass. A couple things about this. So I was reading up on this album. 
And I think this was a misconception that I had. Maybe you had as well. I thought this album did pretty good. I didn't know that this album was a flop. It didn't get. It didn't certify. And I think the problem was is that the record label was disappointed because I think they thought they were going to get another hit, like the you know like the coming off the White Snake thing. It was going to be some huge thing because it's on Geffen Records, same label as White Snake. So I guess I was reading the label was kind of disappointed with this album, and so that kind of surprised me because I always thought this the album did okay because those singles were on MTV quite a bit, Jelly Roll and Valley of the Kings. So. Yeah, so that's what I got, man. Blue Murder. Definitely, uh, the amount of sound that they make with a three-piece is just amazing. So It really is. And I, I had them on the list, and then I put them on the honorables because I just kind of – I had talked about them a little bit in the recent podcast, and I wanted to give a little love to some other bands, but it doesn't discredit how much I love Blue Murder, and I think this album is epic. And when I – what you said is big because – it was kind of a flop and it's so odd because when you run down the song titles in your head you sing them all yes. just like you do on like kane roberts albums and cold sweat and whatnot you go whoa how could this have ever not gone huge and that album is so solid i don't know how it didn't achieve a much greater success but it has kind of become a little bit more of a cult classic yeah. which is a bummer you know because it's solid and huge and i love how John Sykes wasn't that thrilled with his own voice and was looking for a million other singers yep. and a million other people tried out and it didn't take. And they said, dude, you're, you're the guy. And they he finally said, okay, we'll make it a three piece. But you know, it's an awesome album. I love this album. Especially thinking, you know, one thing you could say, okay, well, Shadow King didn't make it big cause it was 91 or cold sweats. Right. This was 89. Like this is prime time. Like, Oh yeah. But, you know, in defense of the, the whole White Snake thing, White Snake couldn't capitalize on the success of of the '87 album either. They, they, you know what I mean? Really, slip of the tongue is a flop. So, I know. So, yeah, there you go. All right, man. What do you got for stuff? Yeah. Another band I've talked a little bit about, but it's Lion's Heart from 1992, and it's the ex Grim Reaper singer Steve Grimmett. Oh, and yes. he did um, a much more hard White Snake than the really metal Steve, uh, Grim Reaper on this album, and it works really well. It's it's very cool. It's very melodic hard rock, epic songs. Had enough, ready or not, can't believe. Uh, Steve Grimmett really started to kind of get more polished, if you can imagine that, in, at this time frame for him. But Lion's Heart came out with some really good albums through the 90s. So if you don't know them, check him out. He's got a solid voice, and the riffs are really good. So please check that album out. Yeah, I know him from Grim Reaper and Obit is it Obituary. Onslaught. It's a Onslaught. 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 Get my bands confused. But no, I, I, I got to check out... <laughs> It's Lion's Heart? Lion's Heart, yeah. Okay. And you have the Onslaught VHS. I don't even own Onslaught. I know that's a cool album, but I don't even own it, dude. Dude, I got the promo VHS. So it's right that's in my right. cellar. I could grab it right now, but I don't have a VCR. <laughs> I still have a VCR to play it. <laughs> uh, okay, number seven. This should be no surprise to anybody. I'm going a, a Kiss alumni. Not Mark St. John. Not East Freely. But Vinnie Vincent. Uh, the Invasion, I mean... Oh, yeah. You know, what a great album. Both of the albums. And, and it's sad, and that's all we really got to work with. We only got the, the debut and then All Systems Go. But they're killer albums. You know, Vinnie Vincent, you know, he was a pain in the ass to kiss. That's what everybody <laughs> says, right? He he wouldn't sign his contract. He was constantly probably wanted more money. He was shredding too much for their tastes. And eventually he was just out of the band. But I think he really brought a lot to the band. Did he save Kiss? I don't know. But he definitely brought, you know, a metal element and, and the guitar, you know, that guitar shredder element that was needed for the 80s. And I honestly think he probably could have made uh, Animalize a better album if he was, if he, they would have kept him around. But anyways, uh, hmm. you know, Vinny gets kicked out. He forms this band. Really, at this point, these are guys are all nobodies. You know, Dana Strum sounds like he had some cred in the business, but he was never in any other band that was big that I knew of. 
You know, right. Bobby Rock was an unknown. Mark Slaughter was an unknown. Uh, Fleischman was from Journey, so I guess in that respect, he could kind of throw, you know, oh, Fleischman from Journey and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Vinny from Kiss, but, you know, according to Fleischman, he was never really in the band. He just did the album and, and whatnot. So, got to go Vinny Vincent, man. He's he's And, and I think Vinny, something's coming. He keeps talking about this Judgment Day album, so I don't know if it's coming at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, or maybe it's never coming out because it's Vinny Vincent. I don't know, but, but he's yeah. talking about something coming. Yeah, maybe 2030 it'll come out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, again, I had Vinny Vincent on my, on my list, and then I kicked him off to the honorables just because – we talk about them and whatnot, yeah. and I and I wanted you to get some kiss love in there. I knew you got some kiss love in there. Yeah. And these two albums, dude, they're so damn good. Like, there's nothing wrong with these two albums. I love both of them. I think I like the self titled or or uh, yeah, the self titled more the first album, but I can't deny like ashes to ashes and this and that oh. off, off all systems go. So I don't know, dude. It it spawned a lot of good stuff. And you could even say another band was potentially from the ashes of this band. <laughs> yeah, don't say that. They, they might be coming. Uh, it might be. They might be coming. All right, number six. Cool. So here's a band that I haven't talked about that much, and this Dirty White Boy from 1990. Yeah. Yep. And we got Earl Slick, who's been in pretty much every band. Um, yes. David Glenn Isley. Yeah, David Glenn Isley from Jafria and Kenny Richards from Autograph. And some of the songs to check out would be Bad Reputation, Let's Spend Mama's Money, and Dead Cat Alley. And it was produced by Bo Hill. And again, it was kind of a super group that did nothing. And it sucks because this album is solid dude it's really good hard rock um and there's there's nothing there's nothing bad about it poor david glenn isley kind of just kind of kept going with bands that had mediocre success but he deserves a lot more because he's a great singer so that's it and he came from a band that came from another band that's yeah. right exactly jafria angel there's there's a lot of uh connections there so absolutely okay number six this is a band that has become like a cult classic. Just like you were talking about with the Blue Murder album. This band is a cult classic. This band is Badlands. And we're coming Ooh, from... Yeah. It's a great pairing because we're coming from uh, Jakey e. Lee out of Ozzy. And we're coming... Uh, Eric Singer and Ray Gillen are coming out of Black Sabbath. You know, they're on the... They weren't in Black Sabbath long, and they weren't in Black Sabbath at, like, the height of the Black Sabbath thing. We all know that that was kind of, you know, winding down when they were in the band. But but still, that's where they came from. And even Greg Chason, I was reading, was uh, in Steeler for, like, a few minutes. So, like, he was in the, one of the right. last rounds of Steeler. So they all kind of came from known bands. But, you know, the real standout people, I think, of the band are, are Ray and Jake. And the whole band's solid, but, I mean... They, they wrote the songs, and Ray Gillen's voice is amazing. Say what you want about Ray Gillen. There's a lot of stories that circulate about him, but um, a great singer. Would have loved to have seen what he could have done if, if he had lived. Another band that's kind of out at the wrong time because I feel like, I think overall they weren't playing the 80s game. I think they would have fit mm -hmm. better in the 70s. If, if this band would have came out in the 70s, I think that's, that's kind of where their roots were bluesier and, and zeppelinish and all that kind of stuff so did, yeah, they, did totally. they really fit in with the sound or the look of the 80s no and then once 91 came they got wiped out and you know we didn't mention this much with blue murder but when you look at like john sykes he didn't do anything for like a very long time maybe he puts out a, a random solo album like once in a great while but he really doesn't do anything and he's been in hiding Jakey e. Lee's kind of the same way. He did nothing for like forever. Then he came back with the Red uh, Dragon Cartel, and then that kind of ended quite a while ago. And he's just been quiet. So it's weird how some of the it's weird how like some of these guys never go away, and then other ones were just like gone forever. I mean, Vinny Vincent, you say the same thing. I mean, damn, he was gone. He was gone for a very long time, and uh, just came out. So there's three of them right there that are kind of reclusive. So yeah, totally. And it does. It is unfortunate that this was like a more of a cult classic band because 
this album is so solid and loved by so many people. So great go having it on there. But they had a little bit of the pop sensibility. If you look back at Dreams in the Dark, that's pretty catchy. Um, I mean, High Wire is a great song that kicks the album off. Dreams in the Dark. Um, what's the other one? Winter's Call was the other video. Yeah. And I, I and thought they got, yeah, Voodoo Highway was really good, too. I like a lot of stuff on there, too. They got some big tours, too. I mean, they opened amphitheaters. You know what I mean? Like, they, they were really chalked for success, and I'm not sure what went down other than, like, the time it was released. Yeah. A lot of it, you know, when I talked to Greg, he just said they wouldn't – play the label's game you know what i mean so you, you know they didn't really have like a power ballad or really catchy songs they were kind of against the grain and i, I think it kind of bit them when it came to the sales so yeah totally all right well i think now we're about midway through so this is a great time to queue up headbangers ball so we've got you killing it on the vocals you start the thing off with a super metal scream which is uh <laughs> very important for a song like this i'm on there doing bass some backup vocals. Then we've got Matias, our buddy. He's playing lead. He did the drum programming. And we brought back our friend Chad doing some harmony vocals. So here it is, man. And it asks the question, the epic question, Ricky Rackman or Adam Curry? There's no wrong answer. <laughs> so check it out. That's Any thoughts you want to say before we move on? Anything you want to say about Headbangers Ball? Oh, man, you're an epic songwriter, and I'm stoked to be with you. So thank you very much. Hey, I mean, this is a group effort, you know, especially with the writing. We've been kind of writing things 50-50. I do a lot of the music. You do a lot of the lyrics. So it's a joint effort, team effort. Well, awesome. Team awesome. Metalcast. Yay! <laughs> All right. All right. 
So what's your number five? Number five is where I have Lynch Mob from 1990. Yeah. We all know, you know, which up from the ashes this band arose from. But, literally, um, literally, right? <laughs> <laughs> but album one and two, I really like. Um, they have different singers, but I, I do really like it. Short of some horn section in uh, album number two, which I could live without, but that's okay. Um, not sure I can say much more about it when it comes to the the albums that came after this, but. I believe that the initial era of Lynch Mob was very good. But on this album specifically, Wicked Sensation, you got the title track, She's Evil But She's Mine, and No Bed of Roses. And those songs right there really kind of dictate how awesome and melodic hard rock this is. Um, Ani Logan didn't exactly pull it off live from what I've seen mm, throughout yep, the years. Yep. I mean, I wasn't around for it, but he looked good. He sounded good. I know he's a good singer. I just don't know if he had what it took to pull it off live. I, I'm not sure. But then they got Robert Mason, and that was a good look, too, for them. But I love Lynch Mob, the first and second album, so I had to put them there smack in the middle at number five. Nice. I never have gotten big into Lynch Mob, but I do like No Bed of Rose and, and some of the stuff yeah. uh, on, on the Wicked Sensation album. The second one... We kind of when we talked about the Warrant episode and Robert Mason came up, it's like aside from the single, the video, I don't know any song on that album. So it's just one of those ones where <laughs> like I wasn't feeling it in '90 for some reason, and then by the time the the next one came out was at '91 or two, um, I was I had just moved on. I don't know, I just wasn't catching my attention. So I got I got to go back and at least listen to the second album. Nice. And I'm not gonna listen to the rap one, the rap album. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's messed up. <laughs> okay. My number five. I'm going with L.A. Guns, man. L.A. Guns is kind of like a haven for... It's, a, it's like a refugee camp for uh, band, people from other bands, man. But, wow, okay. Um, so let's trace back. Cause I, I Trace. Let's trace see. Let's trace back. So I had to, <laughs> nice. I had to go back because I'm like, all right, let's make sense of all this. Like, How, how did this all start? So, per Wikipedia, I think this is right, Tracy Guns had L.A. Guns. Axel mm-hmm. Rose had Hollywood Rose. They came together and they created Guns N' Roses. So that's where the name <laughs> of the band comes from. That's where this pairing comes from. Then there's a fallout. Tracy Guns is out of Guns N' Roses and he's, in back, to, he's back to L.A. Guns. So... I've never interviewed Tracy. It's probably something that needs to happen someday. But man, I wonder if I'm sure somebody's asked them, like, are you kicking yourself for like not sticking out in Guns N' Roses? Because I love I, I like LA Guns better than Guns N' Roses, but come on. Well, yeah. from, from a success factor, I mean, just base it off today. LA Guns is playing clubs and Guns N' Roses is playing stadiums. You know what I mean? Like that's mm-hmm. that just shows you you know the public's perception and how the public feels about these two different bands. Yeah. So so I guess in theory we're going to say that Tracy Guns for a hot minute was in Guns N' Roses, so he comes from Guns N' Roses. Uh, Phil Lewis, who wasn't the original singer, um, I can't remember what the original guy's name was, but he mumbled a lot, supposedly. That's what Phil, that's what Phil <laughs> yeah. said, right? And he was out, and Phil came in and kind of rewrote some of the words. So Phil came from Girl. And then even we ended up with Steve Riley from Wasps. And, and, and if you go through the history of this band, I mean, this band has had probably more members than anybody. And, I mean, <laughs> Jizzy Pearl from Love Hate was singing for him. And, you know, all kinds of people have been in and out of this band. But I, I say L.A. Guns is definitely fits the bill as, as having members that come from, you know, different walks of life and different bands. And what can I say about L.A. Guns, man? I, I mean, I think everybody knows the song, so I'm not going to get too deep into them. But, I mean, I've probably first two, first three albums are where it's at for these guys. Pretty cool. You put them on there. I didn't even think of that, dude. And that's the stretch I like to see because I think a lot of mine coming up, maybe the, the next few are might be a stretch, but I like that. And I didn't like, again, I, I would maybe consider Phil Lewis coming from girl or something like that. But yeah, that's awesome. And I'm also in the minority of loving LA guns way more than, uh, than guns and roses. So oh, <laughs> I'm right yeah, there man. with you. <laughs> All the legends know the true shoot, the true guns, <laughs> the LA guns. Yeah. Uh, right, number four. Well, 
here's one that was kind of a stretch that I wonder if uh, you'll have, but I got Brittany Fox coming from Cinderella. Of course. Of course okay. it's okay. okay, good, good. I'm glad I'm glad you I'm, I'm glad you're on board here because I wrote zero notes about it. We <laughs> you don't love need notes. Brittany we don't Fox. need notes on Brittany Fox. Yeah, we don't we know stinking notes. We <laughs> so have three killer albums. Um, Cinderella, I think they screwed up kicking those guys out of the band. No, I'm just joking. I like uh, I love the members of Cinderella. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, Brittany Fox came from the ashes. Cinderella kind of axed these guys, and that kind of sucked for them. They started over. They got a Tom Kiefer kind of sound alike, if you want, with Dizzy. But uh, I, you know, we we can't say enough about Brittany. We're we're big Brittany guys here. And um, I think they succeeded in making really cool albums with Britney Fox as opposed to Cinderella. And I might go as far as to say Britney Fox's three surpassed Cinderella's three in my book because the third Cinderella album sure let me down. And the third Britney Fox album is my favorite. So there you have it. You know, well, there's so much to say. There's so much to unpack here. (laughs) My number four is Britney Fox. Okay, so there's... You know, doesn't surprise me that we would match up at right at the same number with this one. <laughs> Perfect um, segue. <laughs> but basically, you know, I do have a little bit of notes. Is that you know, I don't know exactly the story, and I had Michael Kelly Smith on. I didn't want to really dig into that topic too much. I mean, he's probably talked right. about it a million times. But there was something about these guys that the record label did not like for whatever reason. Of course. I don't know if it was the sound, the look. I don't know what it was, but they they said you got to get rid of these two guys. Now, if you want to hear what Cinderella sounded like with them in it, there is a video for Shake Me, and it was maybe done in, like, 1984, I think, and it's really, mm-hmm. like, cheesy quality, and, and Cinderella looked more, like, Motley Crue-ish, a little bit more metallic, but you can hear it's more of that Britney Fox, like, ACDC Kiss type of a deal that they have going on than, than mm-hmm. what Cinderella became. Now, you ever know, like, there's, like, that movie that sucks but like you think it's great you know what i mean I'm, i've always been that person right like i like everybody hates batman and robin right but i think that's a good movie and everybody hates like <laughs> jack and jill by adam sandler but i th- i think it's funny so sometimes you're just that that person that gets it even though like it's it's off the beaten path and nobody else really likes it i'm not saying that's britney fox but i'm saying the analogy i'm trying to make is if i had to pick I would probably pick Britney Fox over Cinderella. I know it's wrong. I know it's the wrong choice, and I shouldn't be thinking that way. But just over preference, I think that's like if, if you said, you know, put me on a desert island, and you only can bring a couple albums, and it, you can't bring both. I would say I bring Britney Fox. I just think they're they're more mm-hmm. fun uh, albums. And like you said, Cinderella kind of lost it on their third one, and Britney Fox kind of found it. You know, what I mean, they they stayed true to who they were, even with the singer change and everything. So. Big Britney Fox guy. I do prefer the Dizzy Dean albums, the first two, but and you know that's the other thing. People say like Dizzy Dean is a wannabe of, of Tom Kiefer. I don't know. Like he kind of has that vibe, but he has his own vibe. And if anything, he he brings in elements of like Paul Stanley and Brian Johnson that have nothing to do with Tom Kiefer. So you yeah. know, what I mean? so Dizzy Dean is it can't be an influenced by Tom Kiefer. You know what I mean? He he grew up in the seventies and shit. So you know that's the thing that was always pretty blatant about Britney Fox's music. They're, they wore their influences on their sleeves. So like when you listen to Michael Kelly Smith, you hear Ace Frehley. You don't hear George Lynch. You know what I mean? And it's the same thing yeah. when you think of where Dizzy Dean comes from. He doesn't come from Tom Kiefer. He comes from you know Johnson and Paul Stanley and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's that's my rant of Britney Fox. I, I, if I had to pick, I would go with Britney Fox. But I do love Cinderella. Yes, exactly. But I think the, the big difference here is that um, Tom Kiefer never did the splits on stage and then popped right back up and Dude, kept playing music. <laughs> he, would, he would have busted his nut. He couldn't do what, what Dizzy D did. No way. <laughs> All right. Oh, I can't wait to do my number three, man. My number three is genius. But please, you first. <laughs> well, okay, I got one of yours. I got Cold Sweat here from oh, okay. 1990. And, and, and I got it from the, the, you know, the Ashes of Keel. So we talked about this, but um, let's see. They hooked me with the first single, Let's Make Love Tonight. That song still is played regularly with me. I think it's a killer video, a killer single. I never turned it off. And it's catchy and amazing. 
and I wish this band would have achieved humongous success. Uh, I haven't thoroughly checked out Unburied Alive yet, but I know it's going to be killer. It's good. So I'm really looking forward. Yeah, I know you, you actually made me aware that it came out, and um, the, the the vocals are in stereo, so I had one AirPod in, and I was like, what's going on with the vocals? And you're like, dude, put both earphones in. Like, <laughs> oh, that would help, right? <laughs> so I got to check that out, but I know it's going to be great. So Cold Sweat is a band that, you know, I wish they would have just gone huge. Unfortunately, they didn't. I think they opened for, for Dio on the um, amphitheater tour that year, which was huge of them, but it didn't really take off due to the year. And that's all I got to say about Cold Sweat. All right. Well, you know I like Cold Sweat. They were my number 10, and, and uh, it's a great choice. All right, try to, oh, follow, yeah. try to follow me on this one because some people will be screaming to say that this is a solo act, but but let's talk it. Let's talk it through. Number three. David Lee Roth Band. David Lee Roth Band, 1986, okay? So we've got <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Did you know what band he came from? He came from Van Halen. Yes, all right? Huh. We got Billy Sheehan heard of them. coming from the band <laughs> Talus, okay? We got Steve Vai coming from the band Alcatraz and also played with Frank Zappa. Greg Bissonnette, I'm sure he did great things, but I have no idea what band he was in. Uh, but but it's it's in some respects it's a powerhouse supergroup, and it really deserves a lot of credit because when there's you know when you look at Eat Him and Smile, you listen to it, it's a great album. It's probably Dave's best solo album. Some of the music rivals some of Van Halen's music. Let's face it, and it's just great musicians, just great. So you can't say this is a solo act because this. Like you can't say you can't have a solo act and have Steve Vai and, and Billy Sheen in it. There's just no way. So, uh, powerful band, and if you've lo- lived under a rock for many years and you don't know what it sounds like, <laughs> listen to Shy Boy, and you'll be like, yeah, this is this is a band, and this is a great band formed from other bands. So there you go. Well, I didn't even know Shy Boy was a cover. So, I know, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, that's pretty killer. I didn't even think of this. So I love. Thinking outside the box here, and I think I knew about the band that David D. Roth came from before. Yeah, you heard those guys? Yeah, <laughs> had a little bit of success, just a little. <laughs> no, I love it. Great choice. All right, number two. Well, here's where I got Shadow King from '91, nice. and we talked about it. You know, Lou Graham, Vivian Campbell, but the guy that I probably have a crush on at this point because I talk about him so much is Bruce Turgan. <laughs> <laughs> he's a cool but, guy, man. He, he, had a, he ended up in Foreigner as, when, when Lou went back. So, yeah, he's a cool guy. Yeah, and he's got a really good solo album, which I've talked about before as well. So, But, you know, it's killer, dude. you got Lou doing a little bit harder stuff, which, which fits him really well. And I really hope they get to that unreleased stuff someday, which Lou has talked about in some interviews recently. But... I actually have the exact same songs anytime, anywhere. Um, you don't even know I'm alive, which was one that is epic, and da- uh, Danger in the Dance of Love, which you and I both absolutely preach that song. Love but this it. album's so good, dude. It's so thick, and obviously the musicianship is amazing. The vocals are killer, and it's like um, we talked about uh, Streets, that band Streets with. I think Steve Walsh from Kansas. Mm. All of a sudden, you got a guy doing like kind of metal when they came from a, you know, like a 70s band that wasn't like 80s metal. No. And it looks really good in Streets and it looks really good in Shadow King. Yep. And it kind of rears its ugly head a lot in Foreigner, a lot on his solo albums, but a lot in Shadow King. So Lou Graham's vocals are just absolutely outstanding. So showcased a lot here so you know there i am and one guy we got to mention the drummer was kevin valentine who went on to be a future silent hidden member of kiss on the psycho circus album so there, there you oh. go. there's there's a little factoid you may or may not know so i did not know that's pretty cool yeah so he was a ghost player uh, on psycho nice. circus yep yep that's, that's something to be proud of okay my number two dude I gotta go slaughter, because this really is the ashes of another band. Because 
you know, the Vinny, Vince invasion basically just burned out and disintegrated. You know what I mean? Vinny was an asshole. They didn't like him. They just left the band. The, the record label hated Vinny. Basically, I think he blew like a crap load of money or something like that, and the label was a set with him. And they said, you know what? We're going to give the remaining contract to Mark Slaughter and Dana Strum with whatever it is that they come up with. And what they came up with was pretty amazing. And in a lot of ways, it's one of those other things where, you know, do I love Vinnie Vincent Invasion? Yes. But I'm not a fool to know that what was <laughs> more successful, what connected with the public, and that Slaughter. That first Slaughter album right album at the right time and it you know commercially annihilated the Vinnie Vincent Invasion albums you could put probably take the first two Vinnie Vincent Invasion albums and multiply them by whatever and you're still not going to get to the sales that you got with the Slaughter album so um, good stuff and you know it was just a snapshot in time because unfortunately for Slaughter things did change and it was hard for them to keep up with the musical changes but man what a killer album, and what a what a great story. You know what I mean? To, to basically, you know, come out of that band thinking that you, you know, basically Vinny telling you guys are going to be nobodies until you know outshine him, take away his record deal. That's like the ultimate vindication right there. So, Dan, well, people think that we write really good songs together. I hope. Well, you also set me up with some segues. Pretty damn good because <laughs> Slaughter. It's my number, number one. one dude. Nice. <laughs> so that's pretty killer, dude. Um, it again, sucks though, because I feel like I steal your thunder. Like I, I mean, I unless I, I hope you got something more. Maybe there's something I missed. What did I miss? Oh, dude, I was just gonna kind of preach like some of the songs, dude. Mad about you, spend my life in up all night. Like what? What else is there to say? And those songs, I think for like a minute. So okay, hear me out. There was a there was a uh, Metal Edge magazine used to do a video release back in the old days, and they see like a compilation of like going around, hitting these guys on tour, finding that their video shoots and whatnot, and they did a slaughter uh, behind the scenes of one of their concerts, and Mark sitting there on his huge box brick cell phone, and he's he's talking away, and I swear. In that moment, they might have been the biggest band in the world for like probably a day, maybe 48 hours, because <laughs> their album was hitting huge yeah, at that point. Huge, yeah. And yeah, dude. So they pretty much took Vinnie Vincent Invasion and said, Who? and left him in the dust. And Vinnie was probably pissed off. Yep. And Vinnie was jealous, etc. Yep. Which sucks because he was also amazing. But this album didn't come out of my truck tape deck for probably two years and uh, i memorized every song on this album i love it and dude there's not much more i can say about slaughter 1990 nice nice well now it's my time for my number one i can't believe this one's not on your list but i think maybe it's gonna be in your honorables but To go with White Snake, man. <laughs> so let's set the stage here. I got a lot of notes. All right, it's 1978, and David Coverdale is out of Deep Purple. He forms White Snake. Uh, eventually, gets some former members of Deep Purple to join him. I think uh, he's got uh, John Lord on keyboards and Ian Pace uh, on drums. But really, man, White Snake is the ultimate haven for people from other bands, right? Sykes oh, yeah. came from Thin Lizzy. Cozy Powell came from Rainbow, Vivian from Dio, Adrian obviously from Vandenberg, Rudy and Tommy, Rudy was Quiet Riot, and they both came from Ozzy. So, I mean, what a big conglomeration of people from other bands. And you could even go further. You could go to where, where Doug Eldridge came from, Hurricane and Lion. So, Coverdale has always mm -hmm. handpicked the best people from you know the best bands, taken Steve Vai from David Lee Roth. You know what I mean? So... It's just, I could go on and on. Red Beach from Winger. I mean, Coverdale's always played with the best players. And with us, we we're always preaching, you know, self-titled, slip of the tongue. Those are the best. But there's some good stuff before and after. So, yeah, I think that's the ultimate band from other bands and the most ultimate haven for talented rock stars is Snake. 
Yeah, dude. I, I kind of think of them as like the minor leagues, you know? So many <laughs> but it's major. Guys. Major, though. You know, minor leagues, but major leagues, yeah. Yeah, it's like the Oakland A's, you know? They just keep getting all the good players and dishing them out for more money. Yep, but, yep. <laughs> but obviously, huge white snake guy, 87 and slip. Um, I didn't even really think about them because... I don't, I, just for that reason, there's so many all stars that I just that thought they, they must have come from other, but then the breeding grounds. I don't know. Yeah, so that's a really good call by you. Yeah, but but, but I think people forget. Not I mean, people know it, but it's sometimes you don't think about it. But like Coverdale was in Deep Purple. You know, you always think just yeah. associated with White Snake, but he definitely did a few albums with with Purple. Um, honorables. There's got to be quite a few. I actually started thinking of some while we were talking. I, I put them in my notes. I was some like I can't like I can't freaking believe that I missed this one. But uh, oh yeah, f- fire them off. What do you got for your honor rules? Yeah, I will fire them off. I won't. I won't take too long because there's a lot. So Randy Jackson's China Rain. We've talked about them before. He was from Zebra. Yep. Um, Wild Horses had some members of Kingdom Come. I had Blue Murder. Um, Easy Living. From the ashes of Bonfire. Yep. 21 Guns from the ashes of Thin Lizzy. Um, Bangalore Choir, Heavy Bones, House of Lords, Mr. Big, Hardline, obviously Journey Connections. Damn Yankees. Oh, that's Unruly, a good one. That's a good one. Unruly Child, Alias. Um, yep. You know which one I thought m- you might have a stretch and be on there? Is Dio. I had Dio on Dio, there. Dio, think from about Rainbow. it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's all kinds of Dio connections. Um, Jailhouse, Last in Line, of course, and then yep. Mars, M-A-R-S, from um, the compilation kind of, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, what would we call it, the super group from the mid-80s. Yep. So, yeah, that's all I got for honorables. So one band, some of these bands I appreciate them, but they're not some of my favorites, and some of them are my favorites, and I have kind of forgot about them, and I added them after the fact. But anyways, um Alcatraz is a big band that kind of had people from all over the place. Had the guys from New England. It had uh, Graham Bonnet, who came from Rainbow and MSG. Ingve Malmsteen, who came from Steeler. So that was like a big kind of a pairing of a a bunch of different guys. Um, I had Lynch Mob. I had Freely's Comet. Heavy Bones, I thought about. We're taking Quiet Riot and Cats and Boots. Um, And we're getting Heavy Bones. Rainbow comes from Deep Purple. And Ronnie James Dio came from Elf, so a lot of different people from different bands always made it in Rainbow. But Joe Lynn Turner was in the band Fandango. He ended up in, in Rainbow. So a lot of people from different bands ended up in Rainbow. This one doesn't fit the bill 100% because as I was doing some research, he didn't help form the band. But I wanted to mention Eyes with Jeff Scott Soto. And oh, I'll, yeah. And I want to challenge you if you knew this because, I, dude, I did a lot of reading about bands for this episode. So I didn't realize that James Christian, who went on to House of Lords, left Eyes. Did you know that? He was the original singer of Eyes? Well, as far as I know, that was a different Eyes. I don't know the other band members, actually, so I could be totally wrong. But I always thought that James Christian's Eyes was a different version or a different, a completely different band altogether than the uh, Jeff Scott Soto Eyes. I do not know the other band members' names, though, so I, I can't confirm that. But I have seen several videos of Eyes with James Christian. It's really good stuff, although it's kind of awkward because it's James Christian with a mustache and eyeliner on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, so I, I, I can't confirm that it's the same eyes okay but i do know that there was two eyes is out there i two, think <laughs> two eyes makes sense uh and, but like eyes is a cool band and, Je- and that jeff scott soto from Ingve, you know Ingve was in that band um of course one that came to mind when you said el petrelli i was kicking myself was megadeth i mean oh yeah <laughs> dave mustaine coming from metallica i mean come on and that's been a one where it's been you know all kinds of people coming in like marty freeman and and uh and el petrelli and a lot a lot of heavy hitters have, have passed through megadeth um, I don't know if I said I had Lynch Mob, but you know another band that we got to mention is um, Don Dawkins' band because that yeah. really was in his mind was Dawkins. It really wasn't a solo band. It was a you know it was, it's kind of like what we did said with Roth. I mean, you had Mickey D from King Diamond, you had John Norm from Europe, you had Peter Baltz from Accept, um, and I don't know the other guy might have been an unknown, but anyways, but there was quite a few heavy hitters in the Don Dawkins band. So those are just a few yeah. that I had and. Uh, 
Yeah, good stuff, man. It's I mean, it's funny to, to follow these family trees of these bands. <laughs> that was truly up from the ashes, right? Because wasn't John Norum in there? Did you say that? I did. Europe? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. There you go. And that was truly up from the ashes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well. Yeah. We did it. We had. We did a good one, man. We came up with some good ones. You you pulled out some rare ones, which I was hoping you would, and uh, some of them were a stretch uh, through both of ours. But I think we explained ourselves pretty well. Absolutely. That was great, dude. All right, brother. Sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man. Have a good night. All right, man. You too. Thanks. Yep. Bye.